baby on the right. deal. We have uh, bought the cover. Let's, let's jump right into it. All right. So today's class, now we're talking about start talking about actual implementations of concurrent to protocols. Um, so real quickly, the uh, the one announcement I have is that we have a, a again another guest speaker coming tomorrow for our seminar series on hardware accelerator databases. So this will be Bright Light out of London, and so there'll be a GPU accelerated databases. So this will be the second to last one, and the last one we'll have on GPUs, and then the, the very last one will be later in November will be all about actually doing FPGAs and, and custom ASICs. So <clears throat> last class, we spent most of our time talking about the isolation guarantees of transactions as, as described by the ACID uh, moniker. And the sort of the two key things I want to sort of reiterate again was when we had this discussion about what it means for a schedule to be serializable. And I said that there was this distinction between what was conflict serializable and view serializable. And for that discussion last class was not about how to actually generate schedules that produce that are either uh, you know conflict serializable or view serializable. It's really about if I give you a schedule and it's static and the, the, the operations are fixed for the transactions, can you tell me whether it's it's, it's serializable or not? So again, the distinction between conflict serializable and, and view serializable had to do with in the case of conflict serializable that we can verify that it was conflict serializable by swapping the 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 order of, of operations until we sort of can convert the, the schedule into be two, two uh, serial schedules, or we generated the dependency graph and checked to see whether there was, there was any cycles. And I said again, the you know the the, the textbook definition of, of conflict serializable had to do with this, but in the real world, databases will say they're serializable and they really mean conflict serializable. And then view serializable had to do with uh, if it was the the schedule would still generate an outcome that was still considered co correct by the application. So I showed the example of adding up the number of counts that are, that are greater than or equal to zero. I don't care whether I got the exact amount in the, uh, in, in, you know, for each account, I, just, I knew it was greater than zero, and that's all I cared about. Or I did that blind write where I, don't, you know, I sort of lost all the rights to previous transactions. I don't care whether they were actually not, not serializable or not. But in the end, I saw the right from that last transaction. And again, no database system actually can support this because it requires you to understand the semantics of the application. So again, the, the things that we're caring about here, uh, again, we have these fixed schedules, and we see these, these conflicting operations, and we know that we can't swap the order of them, and therefore, this is not complex serializable. Okay? So that was, that was sort of the gist of what we were talking about last class. So now where we're at today is we need a way to guarantee on the fly that uh, schedules we're going to have for transactions are going to be serializable without knowing what the entire schedule is ahead of time. Right, so again, all my examples, I gave you the schedules, I gave you the read and write operations for the transactions, and I, you know, I would say, is that conflict serializable or not? But now in the real world, the, you know, the real world doesn't work that way. Right? Your application connects to the database, starts issuing you know, whatever queries it wants. We don't know what you're going to be doing in the future. Right? So we can't use the same techniques that we talked about last class. Last class was all about verifying whether a, an existing schedule was serializable. So now we need a way to figure out how to actually how to do this on the fly. And, and this is what real systems are going to do. So the one solution we're going to talk about today is to use locks to protect database objects. And I said, remember, that there was this distinction in concurrent control protocols between pessimistic and optimistic. So using locks is a, lo is a pessimistic protocol because we're going to assume that there's going to be a conflict, and therefore we're going to require you to, require you to acquire a lock before you're allowed to do anything because we, we think you're going to you know, have problems later on. So if we go back into our, this example we showed, that I showed, just showed, we can now introduce locks into our schedules. Right? So here at the very beginning, we have you know, the transact T1 is going to get a lock on A. And this lock request will be, sort of has to occur before we're able to do any operation we want on uh, the object. So we say we want to lock on A before we can read A or write A. And the way we're going to keep track of who holds what locks is through a lock manager. So a lock manager is going to be the centralized coordinator that is essentially like the traffic cop for the entire system. So anytime I want to get a lock on an object, I got to go to the lock manager and ask, hey, give me that lock. In this case here, at the very beginning, assume no other transactions are running at the same time. We ask for the lock on A, we go to the lock manager, it says nobody has that lock, so you're allowed, you're, you know, it's, it's granted to it. 
it's allowed to run. But now let's say, again, we're assuming we have a single thread. We, have, we can only really execute one operation at a time. So transaction T2 starts, and it wants to get the lock on A. But when it goes to the lock manager, the lock manager knows that, oh, I already gave out the lock on A to T1. Therefore, I'm going to deny your request. And the transaction T2 essentially is, is, is going to have to stall and wait for, the, you know, for, for, the, for that lock to be given back to it. Now, how, whether it waits inside the lock manager because it stalls the thread, or it sends back a rejection, and then uh, T2 goes to some kind of scheduler and says, hey, I'm waiting for this lock, but I can't do anything now. Schedule my thread for something else. That's left up to the implementation. We don't care about that at this point. We just want to understand the protocol to do this. Then T, T1 goes along, then it finally unlocks A, and then the lock is released, and now the lock manager is keeping track of, oh, well, T2 needed lock A. I couldn't give it to it. So now that lock A is now available, it goes back and gives it to T2, and then T2 can run and commit. And when it's done, it releases the lock. Right? So this is the high level we're, we're, what we're going to do today. Right? We're going to use locks to protect objects, to prevent transactions from reading and writing to them, before, uh, you know, but they have to quiet the lock first before they're allowed to do anything. So today we're going to start off talking about the different lock types. Um, we only need to have two in the beginning. We'll have uh, three more at the end. And then we'll have two, we'll talk about the two-phase locking protocol. And then we'll get into the details of how can we extend the, the protocol to deal with deadlocks, how to deal with hierarchical locking or multi-granular locking, right? Can you take locks and, and tuples or, or attributes or columns or whatever? And then we'll finish off, if we have time, talking about uh, locking in practice and, and how people actually use, use, uh, use the concurrency protocol and use different isolation levels. All right, so back when we talked about uh, index concurrency control, I showed this table before from uh, th this book from Gertz Graffy. And he made this distinction between locks and latches. And we focused on latches for, in our concurrency control for indexes because this was an, this, we were trying to protect the physical soundness of the internal data structure itself. And so now what we're dealing with is, in this talk is all about locks. So these are trying to protect the sort of logical database contents, tables, uh, tables and, and, and rows and single, single attributes and single values. And so we'll go through all these, uh, these, different, these different parts of this as we go along and through the lecture. Um, but again, the key thing about this, and that they sort of distinguish this between the latches, is that it really has to do with this deadlock piece, right? In the in the latching protocol, we said we need to have be very careful about how we require latches, because there wasn't going to be somebody in the background that can come in and save us if we ever have a deadlock. And the way we did that was making sure we acquire latches always in one direction. In locks, we can, and with database locks, we can't actually do that because we don't know what the queries are going to be doing, or transactions are going to be doing ahead of time, so we can't sort of enforce any kind of order in how they acquire them. So we can end up with deadlocks, and so we need a way to deal with that. And that's essentially what you guys are be implementing for Project 3. So at a, at, at a very basic two-phase uh, locking protocol, or two-phase locking protocol, is that there's going to be two types of lock. Shared lock and exclusive lock. And you sort of think of these as like the read latch and the write latch that we talked about before. So shared lock is just as it sounds. It's a lock that can be shared for reads among other transactions. So if I, if I have a shared lock on, on an object and another, th another, object, another, threat, another transaction wants to read that object, they can also get a shared lock. Those things are compatible. An exclusive lock is what you use for writes. And it basically says the object that's under this exclusive lock, the, whoever owns that lock has exclusive access to it. Nobody else can even read, read to it or write it to it at the same time. And again, we can have this compatibility matrix to say like, if, if one thread holds a share lock, another thread can get a share lock, but they, they can't get any other lock if, they want to, if one, at least one of them is exclusive. So what's going to happen is transactions are going to, before they do any read or write operation on, on an object, we're going to go to the lock manager and say, hey, give me the lock for this, for this object. Or if they already hold a, like a share lock and they want to maybe write to it, they, they can do an upgrade and say, I hold the share lock, but now give me the exclusive lock. And the lock manager's job is to figure out whether you're allowed to get that lock or not. If you're allowed to, then you get it and you keep running. If you're not, because somebody else holds, holds a lock that's incompatible, then you get blocked and the request is denied. And then it's up for the transaction's job to then release the locks when they're done with them. All right, we give it back to the lock manager so the lock manager can say, all right, well, here's the transactions that are waiting for this. They can now run too. So the way this is actually going to be implemented, and this is what you'll be doing again for project three, 
is essentially you're going to maintain an internal lock table that keeps track of what locks are being held by what transactions and what transactions are waiting for other locks. And then you can have a queue for the, for the waiting locks so that when, uh, when a lock is released, you just go pick out whatever's the beginning of the queue and say, all right, you're now, the, you're now the transaction that holds the lock. Does the lock manager need to be persistent or durable after a crash? Anyone take a guess? You're taking a head yes, why? I saw you just now, yes. You did this. That's a yes. So why? <laughs> she says maybe not. Yes, the answer is not, right? Because think about this. If I crash, it's just like the, 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 the buffer pool manager you guys built for project, project one. Right? If I crash, memory gets wiped away, I come back and have to figure out what was going on, you're not going to have transactions still running, right? Because again, we, we said there would be no partial transactions. So a transaction did a bunch of writes, and then it was going to do a bunch of more writes too, but then it crashed. You come back, that transaction needs to get rolled back. So you don't need, you don't need to maintain the lock table on disk because you're never going to come back and have the, you know, any transaction resurrected. Because again, think about it in a practical sense, from an implementation standpoint, the client that was holding the connection to the process, that connection is now severed, right? And it doesn't know in what, you know, it doesn't know at, uh, how many, <coughs> excuse me, it doesn't know what queries actually got persisted, actually got saved. Everything just has to get rolled back. So the lock table does not need to be persistent. Um, and that's why you don't have to put it into, into the buffer pool. All right, so let's go back to our, our simple query before, or sorry, simple, simple schedule before. And now we're going to show that we're, instead of just doing lock and unlock, we're going to actually acquire different lock types. So T1 wants to do a read on A, write on A. So the very first thing it's going to do is get an exclusive lock on A. Nobody else is running, so it's allowed to do this. Then it goes ahead and unlocks it. Um, and then transaction T2 can get the exclusive lock on A, does a write, releases it. Now transaction T1 wants to do a shared lock on A because it just wants to read it. It's allowed to get that and allowed to uh, do the read and, and complete it. What's the problem with this? It's correct, right? I, what did I say before? I said that with these locks, you had to acquire the lock, the right lock type or lock, right lock mode. Oh, sorry, the correct lock mode. Be, be very careful. Correct lock mode on whatever object you want to access before you're allowed to access it. So we did that here, right? But what happened? Yes? He said dependency graph is more cyclic, just even, even, even more straightforward. We have an unrepeatable read here, right? Because this transaction did a write on A, this transaction did a read on A, but now it's going to get the value back is going to be, is going to be this one here and not the one that it wrote here or even the one that it read here. Right? This is an unrepeatable read anomaly we talked about last class. So this just goes to show you that just because you have locks doesn't mean you're magically going to get correct schedules. So we need to be some, a little bit smarter. Right? And this is what two-phase locking does for us. Two-phase locking is going to allow us to use locks in a certain way. And it's going to guarantee that we're going to end up with schedules that are conflict serializable or just serializable. Right? And it's essentially going to be used in the lock manner to determine whether you're allowed to uh, acquire a lock or not. So this is the oldest concurrent to a protocol. It goes back to 1975, 1976. This was invented by the IBM guys, by Jim Gray, who won the Turing Award in uh, 1995, 93. Right? They, they, they built this concurrent to protocol for system R. Because again, back then, it was like all brand new. There was no, there was no, you know, there's no textbook to say, here's how to do transactions in concurrent to So this is what they came up with. And this is the first provably correct, uh, and correct meaning it would generate schedules that are serializable. Uh, concurrent to your protocol for a shared database environment. So again, the key thing about this protocol versus the dependency graph or the, the swapping method is we don't need to know what all the queries you need, you're going to execute ahead of time. We can do this on the fly. So two-phase locking is as it sounds. There's two phases. So the first phase is the growing phase, and this is where transactions are going to request all the locks you need as you go along to, from the lock manager. And you can, the lock manager can, can still decide whether you're allowed to have them or not, based on whether somebody else already holds that lock. But then as soon as you release one of those locks, as soon as you unlock it and give it back to the lock manager, you're automatically put into the shrinking phase. And in the shrinking phase, you're only allowed to release locks. You're never allowed to acquire new ones. 
If you try to go acquire a new one, which you technically can't really do in SQL, but if you try to go acquire a new one, then that's a violation of the two-phase locking protocol, and the, and the, the database system will abort you. Another way to think about it is sort of as a, a visually like this, right? So say this is the lifetime of a transaction, and then the y-axis is the number of locks that the transaction is holding. So when I'm in the growing phase, I can keep acquiring more and more and more locks. As soon as I release one, then I'm now down in the shrinking phase. And I can hold the locks for as long as I want. I can release any lock that I want, uh, but I can't, I'm not allowed to go acquire new ones. And so if you did actually something like this, if I released a bunch of locks, then try to acquire more, again, this would be a violation of the two-phase locking protocol, and the database system would actually abort you. Right? As long as you have these two phases and you follow this protocol, you're, you'll be guaranteed to generate schedules that are serializable. So let's go back to our example and now introduce, again, now using two-phase locking. So we'll get exclusive lock on A and T1. That's fine. We get that. Then we do a read on A, then a write on A. And then now I get my exclusive lock. I try to get my exclusive lock on A and T2, but this is denied because T1 holds it. Then I do my read on, on A here, and then I unlock it, and at which point T2 gets kicked and says, here, you now have the lock now, and then it can run. Right? And this is, this is a serializable schedule thanks to two-phase locking. Right? Pretty straightforward. Yes? So for shrinking, that is start when it's unlocked A. So his question is, does the shrinking phase stop, start when it unlocks A? Yes, right here. But this is, a, this is sort of an illustration of what's actually going underneath the covers. In your application, you, you don't actually, you usually don't explicitly say lock something, unlock something. So you can't write in SQL, unlock this, unlock that, right? This is just showing you how the protocol works. The data system could decide, you know, actually, no system actually does this, but you could speculate that, all right, well, I don't think you're needed to do anything after this, so I'll just, I'll, I'll go ahead and unleak something, unlock something. So basically, when the first unlock starts, that's when... That's, that's immediately in the shrinking phase. Okay. So again, the two-phase locking by itself will guarantee that you generate schedules that are serializable, right? Again, and, and based on what we talked about last class, it'll be a, you'll have a, a precedence graph that is, that is acyclic. Right? There's no cycles between, between nodes. But it is susceptible to another problem called cascading aborts. So if I go back here, all right, uh, T1's going to do a read on A, write on A, then a read on B, and write on B. Transaction T2 is going to do a read on A and write on A. So at the very beginning, and also too, sorry, at T1 at the bottom, you see we're here, here we're going to do an abort. So what will happen is if I run this, and this is a correct schedule with two-phase locking, right, because I had acquired the exclusive lock on A and B, then I read A, wrote A, unlocked it, and then I read B and, and wrote B, but then I aborted. But in between this point here, T2 was running, and it read A and wrote A, and so it read the version of A that was written by th this transaction here. So we can't have this, right? This, is, this, is, this would violate our dirty read, uh, vi this would produce a dirty read anomaly, right? Which would be bad because we're essentially leaking information about this, about this write before this transaction actually committed. So at this point here, if transaction T2 tells the data system I want to uh, commit, we can't allow it because it read something from a transaction that has not actually committed. So under two-phase locking, this schedule is permissible. This is still a correct schedule, but again, like we'll have this cascading rollback problem because this guy abort, and then whatever this guy did, it'll have to abort too. So the downside of this is that this is essentially all wasted work. We did a bunch of, you know, say this thing, instead of just reading, you know, reading, writing A, it updated a billion tuples. We had to sit with those, all those one billion tuple updates until this thing actually find out what happens to this. Right? And if it ends up aborting, then all that you know, one billion tuple updates gets thrown away. All right? So again, two-phase locking will guarantee that you have uh, serializable schedules, um, but it's going to potentially produce schedules that, that uh, could have dirty reads and require cascading rollbacks. And then the other problem we haven't got to yet is also you could have deadlocks. So we're going to talk about how to solve these two problems here. So we'll focus first on how to handle dirty reads. Um, and then we'll focus on how to handle uh, de deadlocks, okay? So the other thing I'll also say too is that there's going to be 
some cases where two-phase locking would, uh, that you could, you could have a schedule that would actually be serializable, but because two-phase locking is a bit more, uh, I don't want to use the word strict, a bit more cautious or pessimistic, then maybe necessarily you would need to be, there are schedules that are complex serializable that would, are not permissible under two-phase locking. But those are like corner cases and we, there's, there's, there's no easy way or e efficient way to handle them. All right, so the way that we're going to handle the cascading abort problem is to use a variant of two-phase locking called strict two-phase locking. And it's sort of a misnomer because under strict two-phase locking, there really is kind of only one phase. Um, and that's the growing phase where you just keep acquiring locks. And then you actually don't unlock anything until the very end. So I can keep acquiring locks all I want, and you never actually release them. And it's only when you go to commit here at the very end that at that commit moment, then you release all your locks, right? And that's what I'm saying. Like it's not really a shrinking phase because you don't really shrink. You just shrink at the very end. So this is going to only again only generate schedules that are complex serializable. Uh, but in a lot of cases, it's going to be it's going to be more cautious and more pessimistic than 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 you maybe actually otherwise need. So whether you want to use two phase, strict two-phase locking or regular two-phase locking, it really depends on how susceptible your application is or how susceptible your transactions are to cascading aborts. So the word strict actually means something uh, more formally in the context of concurrent control. So the word strict means that any value uh, that is written by a transaction uh, is not read or overwritten by any other transaction until that first transaction that modified it completes. Again, that's why we can't have that cascading abort, right? Because the first transaction would have modified it, never released the lock, and then nobody else can read, read or write that lock, read, read or write that change. So again, this is gonna how, the benefit of this is that we're not gonna have any cascading aborts, we're not gonna worry about wasted work, um, and it actually makes it really also easy to roll back transactions, which I haven't really talked about yet, it, because we're not gonna have to maintain different versions or different, uh, of, of, an, of an object because we may have to roll back multiple times. So in the case of strict two-phase locking, I modify the object. Nobody else can read it. Nobody else can write it. I know how to roll back to the old version in case I need to abort my transaction that modified it. But it's not like I need to maintain a chain of versions if we have multiple transactions modifying it and then they can't commit yet. So then when I abort, I need to figure out how to roll back to the very first one. So let's look at an example here. This is my favorite example of, of moving $100 from my account to my bookie's account. We'll do that in transaction T1. And then transaction T2, we're just going to compute the, the sum of all the, uh, the total amount of all the accounts in, in the bank. Right? And again, this echo thing is not really a command that we have in our database system. I just want to show that this is somehow we're, we're admitting this, this, this the, the, the summation of A and B out to some world. It's the final result of this. All right, I could make this a write back into the database, but I, I didn't want to complicate things. All right, so here's, the, here's how to execute that, the, 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 these transactions with locking, with exclusive locks and shared locks, but without two-phase locking. All right, and so say again, we start with our initial value of $1,000 per bank account. So under this approach here, uh, T1 would get the, get the exclusive lock on A, T2 would try to get the share lock on A, and then we'd have to pause and wait for that, but then T1 releases the lock on A, um, T1 is granted it, does the read, unlocks it, and then tries to get the share lock on B, but then T1 tries to get that, uh, and it has to wait, and then we can kind of compute our summation here, right? And so the problem in this particular example is what we saw before, where we have, a, we have this transaction reading the intermediate state of the database while this transaction is running, and at the point where we've taken $100 out of my account, but before we put the $100 back in. So when we compute the summation here, we're gonna, be, we're gonna have, um, Actually, that should be two thousand. That should be one hundred, one thousand nine hundred. We're missing hundred dollars because we're reading this. We're reading the state here before we actually put the money in, right? So this is what you get without two-phase locking. With two-phase locking, uh, the non-strict version, that T one would start get the transaction, get the exclusive lock on A. This tries to get the share lock. It can't, so it has to wait. Then we do our modification here. But before we unlock A, we get the exclusive lock on B because we know we're going to modify it later on. And then we can unlock A, and now we're in the shrinking phase. So this guy can then do the read, but then it can't get the share lock on B because that's being held. So it ends up stalling again. But then when we, when we get to the bottom, we make sure that now we're reading the, the state of A and B together. 
so we get we get the correct value. And then basically strict phase locking is I get the exclusive lock on A, this guy's get the share lock, he has to wait, and then I get the exclusive lock on B, right? Because I, I never get back this until the very end. And then when I go to commit, then I unlock everything. And then now this guy can 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 run, and then I get the right value. So in this case here, you can kind of see strict two phase locking is essentially creating a, a serial ordering of, of the transactions. Right? Because it, it allows it makes sure that nobody can read anything. Uh, that was modified by another transaction until that transaction completes because I'm holding the locks to the very end. Yes? Um, so I think proof based locking uh, controls how the lock manager uh, acquires and release lock, right? So what if, what if the schedule is not written uh, uh, if it, uh, exactly for proof based locking? What if you try to acquire lock before you release all of them? So you, your, your statement is, um, and your question is, in this example, in this example here, I showed that I'm acquiring the locks in the right order as required by two-phase locking. Your question is, what if I don't have it in the right order? Again, two-phase locking is a protocol you're going to run, at, you're going to use at runtime. So I'm showing you ecstatic examples here because it's on PowerPoint. But in the real world, you don't know what everything the transaction is going to do ahead of time. So you're sort of seeing these one request at a time, right? And so if you see the request one at a time, then then and the data system is using two-phase locking, then it will enforce the, the, the correct ordering as required by two-phase locking. Does that make sense? Right, again, last class was all about static schedules and how do you actually verify whether it's serializable or not. Two-phase locking is a protocol you can use to generate serializable schedules. Question, yes? Yeah, so the question is, under strict two-phase locking, Am I releasing the lock before or after I commit? It's sort of all at once, right? Again, I'm on PowerPoint. I can't really show you know, how that works. But like this commit kind of includes all of these. Like I'm done. I'm not going to execute any more queries. I'm not going to acquire, you know, acquire any more locks. Here's, here's my commit, you know, commit my transaction and release my locks. That's considered atomic internally. Right? And we use latches to protect the data structures to make this happen. And you, you'll see this when you implement this in Project 3. So his question is, are there any mechanisms to ensure that the unlock and the commit are atomic? Yes. Latching. Because again, how, how is this actually implemented, right? You're going to implement this in, like, uh, you have these internal data structures, right? You, you have, could have a, a state table for what transactions are active. You could, you actually don't need to, to this actually doesn't need to be entirely atomic, all right? Because you think about it, if I, say I maintain a, an internal table that says my transaction has committed or not. If I've committed or not, if, if I say I flip that flag and say I've committed, but I haven't released my locks yet, it doesn't matter because nobody can, like the lock manager can prevent anybody from releasing those locks. So it doesn't matter that I've committed but haven't released the locks yet, right? Would it matter though if you release the locks first and then you commit? Um, You could do that, but you would still need to potentially, it depends on the isolation level. You may mean, maintain some global state for transactions to say, all right, this, this tuple was read, or tuple was modified by this object. Uh, I got the lock for it, but I'm running under strict two phase locking. I shouldn't have been able to do that because if it, if it was committed, it would you know, still hold the lock. So if I got the lock for it, then I can assume maybe it's, then it's committed and therefore it's okay for me to go. This is a low level implement, implementation detail that. Uh, if you release the locks after you commit, everything's fine. I think you can still get by releasing the, the locks first and then commit. Depends on how it's implemented. Depends on where the, whether there's a global state to say what transactions are active or not. Postgres has that. MySQL has this. Some MMA databases don't. It depends on implementation. But for our purposes on PowerPoint, we're fine. Yes? The question is, for the non-strict two-phase locking example, how does the data system decide whether to release the lock or not? So this is what I was saying. The, the, you don't really write you know, transactional programs through SQL with explicit lock and unlock. Um, yeah, I'm talking about the database management system. Right, but I'm saying, like, I, 
I can't write, there's no unlock command in SQL to tell the data system, go ahead and unlock, right? We're sort of just dealing with this at the high level, like sort of the, as sort of a high level abstract way of describing the protocol. So whether you actually can write unlock yourself, it's, most systems probably don't, don't let you do that. So your question, I think, is asking, like, all right, if I can't actually call unlock explicitly, how does, it, how does the data system know to unlock? It doesn't. Most systems run strict two-phase locking. I think we, we, we can look some, I don't think you can unlock tables, but I think you can, um, sorry, I, I, I don't think you can lock and unlock explicit single tuples, but I know you can unlock and unlock tables. We can try that in Postgres in a second to see, to see how they actually implement that, what happens. Yes? So for, for two-phase locking, like you mentioned, that it's growing and shrinking. Yes. Do you look, I mean, like by growing, is it like all transactions or one transaction? So, one, like, so my, my example here of the, the lifetime of transaction, um, this thing here, this was for a single transaction. This is the lifetime of the transaction. It's in its growing phase. Other transactions can be in the shrinking phase or whatever. We don't care. It's just for our transaction, how are we acquiring locks? Okay, Let's see where we left off. Um, so, if again, if you think about the universe of schedules we talked about last time, so all schedules would be this giant blob, and then you have serious schedules in the middle. Conflicts or lies would be here, and then a subset of this, I, I, I forgot to draw this, a subset inside of this would be two phase locking, and then a subset inside of that would be strict two phase locking. And then there'll be a larger blob of schedules that are going to be uh, uh, non-cascading. So again, I, I should have drawn this. I, I had it in the old one. I, I took it off to fix it. So inside of conflict sterilizable, there'll be a box that says uh, 2PL. And inside of that will be a box that says strict 2PL. And then inside of that, you'll have serial. Right? So, so again, it's more restrictive. The, the scope is more narrow then conf all co possible conflict serializable schedules, but there's no easy protocol that you can implement that'd be efficient that, that would capture all of these, the all, all possible non, uh, all possible conflict serializable schedules. All right, so the other problem we gotta deal with now is deadlocks, right? So strict two-phase locking handles the cascading aborts, but now we gotta handle uh, deadlocks in both strict two-phase locking and non-strict two-phase locking. So there's two ways to do this. Right? And again, the, the, uh, the deadlocks are sort of obvious, right? If I have a transaction in T1, it wants to get a lock on A, then we get a share lock on B, then we try to get the share lock on A, but that's being held by transaction T1, and this guy gets the exclusive lock on B, and that's being held by T2, right? We have a deadlock, right? This is sort of standard CS problem, right? So we have to, we have to deal, with this, deal with this. So abstractly, the way to think about this is that the, you know, we saw this in, in the dependency graph, or the precedence graph, it really, it's a cycle in this graph of transactions waiting for other transactions. And essentially what we need to do is we need to have a protocol in place that allows us to either detect when we have a cycle and break that cycle by killing a transaction, or we can have a protocol in place that would prevent that deadlock from actually occurring ever. And that's sort of what we did in, in latching, right? We made sure we always acquired things in the right order. So we'll cover the first one first, uh, detection. So what's gonna happen is that we're gonna maintain inside the data system something called a waits for graph that looks a lot like the dependency graph, but in the dependency graph we were waiting for, sort of for uh, we had dependency between objects, help between or be, objects being operated on by different transactions. This is dependencies between transactions waiting to acquire locks being held by other transactions. So in a waits for graph, we're gonna have a node for every transaction, and they'll have an edge between two, two transactions or two nodes if one transaction is waiting for a lock being held by another transaction. So when you actually generate this, this weights for a graph can depend. The most common ways what you guys would do on project three is actually you build this on the fly every single time your deadlock detection or detection thread wakes up. So the idea is that you have this thread in the background that gets kicked up every so often. I think Postgres is uh, 10 seconds, or Postgres might be one second, MySQL might be 10 seconds, right? You can, something you, you can configure. And the thread will wake up, it'll look at what transactions it has, it builds this weights for the graph, identifies the cycles, and then it has to make a decision about uh, how to break that. 
So if you go back to this, this really simple example here, here we don't even have any reads and writes, we're just trying to acquire locks, right? So our weights our graph would be like this. So we have a share lock on B, we want to get in T1, but that's being held by T2, so we have an edge from T1 and T2. We have an exclusive lock request on C, but that's being held by T3. Doesn't matter that one's exclusive lock, one's share lock, as long as the locks are incompatible, then you have an edge. So we have an edge here from T2 to T3, and then we have an exclusive lock request in A, but that's to have a shared lock already held by T1, so we have an edge from T3 to T1. And again, of course, now we have a cycle. Right? So the other interesting thing about this, when you guys build this in Project 3, is we don't actually need to be, for this thing to be super accurate. Right? Meaning, we don't need to lock the entire, we don't need to latch the entire lock table to figure out who's holding what locks, because who cares if we miss one uh, you know, in, in our first pass, because we'll come back around and see it again. Right? And this is another reason why we don't require you, we don't want you guys to build the, the, the weights or graph on the fly as, as transactions, you know, re require, acquire locks and release them. You have this background thread do that, because that's not going to interfere with the critical path of the execution of regular transactions. All right, so, all right, so we have this thread that's going to wake up every so often. It's going to look in our, build this wafers graph, and then check for uh, these cycles, which means a deadlock. And then now we need to make a decision about how we're actually going to handle this. Right? And so we're going to choose a victim in our graph and do something to it. Right? We're going to abort it, and I can either restart it or just kill it all, you know, and kill it straight out. And we can, uh, and then this is going to, when we kill that transaction, we then release all the locks that it was holding, at least the, the, depending how far we roll it back, release its locks, that'll break our cycle and our weights or graph, and then now the whatever transaction that was waiting for that one lock can, can, then, can then start running. Right? So there's this trade-off in, in, in your implementation about how aggressive you actually want to be checking for deadlocks versus the overhead of, of you know, what it takes to check, right? Or the overhead, the overhead of checking has to be trade off, traded off with how long transactions have to wait for, you know, to be released from a deadlock. So I could check for a deadlock every microsecond, but then I'm just burning cycles, burning weights for graph, or looking at it and then trying to figure out whether a cycle. And maybe there, there isn't going to be one very often, right? Or if I could check it every 10 seconds or every, every 10 minutes, then now if there's a deadlock, transactions are, are sitting there forever waiting to be, you know, released uh, by the deadlock detection thread. So this is why this is, this is a tunable parameter in every single database system that does deadlock detection with two-phase locking, because you don't know whether your applications are going to, be, are going to have a lot, of, a lot of deadlocks, and maybe you want to be very aggressive, because so that way you, they're not spinning and waiting to acquire locks that are never going to get, never come out, versus the overhead of checking everything all the time. And the different systems do different things. So, how, so the first issue we got to deal with is how, how to decide how, how, what transaction we want to kill. What, what do we want our victim to be? So choosing a victim is going to depend on a lot of different uh, properties about our transactions. And no one way is better than another. So we can choose things like which transaction is, is the youngest, right? Uh, and if we sign them timestamps when they arrive, we can look at the timestamp and figure out what time they showed up and then kill the ones that are the youngest. We can say which ones have actually executed the most queries. Uh, and therefore, if we abort them, we have to roll back a lot of changes. We can say the number of locks they've already acquired in the, in the database, because it, it's expensive to acquire locks. So if you, if you say, you know, if you acquire like 100 of them and this guy acquires 10, maybe, again, that's wasted work acquiring those 100 locks. I, I maybe don't want to roll back, so I'll kill the guy that only uh, has acquired 10. You can say how many times the transaction's been rolled back, because you don't want to starve it out, right? So there's a bunch of different things you have to consider when you decide which, 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 which transaction to, to kill. Um, again, the, I think usually they always try to keep track of how many times you restart it, so that way you don't starve out a you know, transaction from, from just getting aborted over and over again. And sometimes they'll say, oh, you, you've, you've restarted five times, I can't let you restart again, so just kill you outright. Again, the different database systems do different things. The commercial guys that do two-phase locking with deadlock detection have all sorts of parameters that allow you to, to tweak all these things. Right? And then some of them can get kind of crazy and sort of build predictive models and say, like, well, I think your transaction is going to execute these queries, and therefore you're likely to abort or not abort, so maybe I'll, I'll kill you, not the other one. Right? You can get very sophisticated in deciding how to break these deadlocks, and this is what sort of separates the commercial guys from the open source guys. 
All right, so the next question is how far do we actually want to roll back? So the most obvious thing is to say, all right, well, I executed five queries. I have a deadlock. I can't allow you to proceed. So I'll kill you and then roll back all your five queries. But maybe you actually don't need to do that. Maybe you only need to roll back one query. That releases the lock that you, you were holding for something else. Uh, and then, then that breaks the deadlock. You pause the transaction that you rolled back a little bit, just you know, maybe for a couple milliseconds. And then you're allowed to go rerun the query that you rolled back again and not have to restart the entire thing. And that, that might just be enough to, for, to break the deadlock without again, a, large, a large rollback change. OK? All right, let's do a demo. So we're going to do Postgres and MySQL. Right? Both are implementing uh, two-phase locking um, with deadlock detection. Wi-Fi works. All right, what do we want to do first? MySQL or Postgres? Raise your hand if MySQL. Few. Raise your hand Postgres. Even less. All right, MySQL it is. OK. All right, so we have a, um, a simple table called Transaction Demo. that has two tuples, right? ID 1 uh, with the value 100, ID 2 with the value 200. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is set a flag for the, the, the lock timeout. So this says, so EntityDB is the internal execution engine of, or storage engine of MySQL. So that's why it says EntityDB in front of it. And then lock wait timeout. So this says if, it, if I try to acquire a lock and I can't after 10 seconds, do something, right? So I have two terminals, so I'll do the same thing at the bottom here. This one seems dead, actually. Oh, Wi-Fi. Sorry. All right, there it goes. Right, so I'll set my again, time, time out like that. So the first thing I'm going to do is set the both terminals are run with the serializable isolation level. So I haven't described what isolation level is, but just assumes, again, serializable is exactly what we talked about before, that we want conflict serializable schedules. So the, we'll begin the first transaction. We'll start a transaction down here. And then the first transaction is going to update the first tuple and just add one to, to its value. Right? It's allowed to do that. That's fine. Second, second, second uh, terminal, second transaction is going to update the second tuple and just add one to the value. So that's fine, right? So now we'll go back to the first terminal. We will try to execute an update on the, on the second tuple that, that was already modified by the guy in the bottom. That stalls because the bottom guy holds the exclusive lock for it. We go down here and try to do an update on the first tuple, same thing. Uh, it can't do that because the one above it holds exclusive lock. But now you see what happened actually. Postgre sorry, MySQL recognized that there was a deadlock when we tried to acquire the lock in the bottom one and then killed it Im immediately. Right? And then we also saw, you might have saw the, 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 the terminal at the top, as soon as this guy got aborted, this one then you know, got unstalled because it acquired the exclusive lock from the lock manager and then immediately did the update. All right, did everyone see that? All right, so now the bottom one here, now I am aborted, so I can't do anything. If I ever try to read from the table, it'll tell me I'm going to, all right, let me do that. All right, Postgres will, will do that. But my, my change got aborted. But also you can see down here, I actually don't see any of the updates from the guy above, right, because I'm serializable. Right? I can't read anything from an uncommitted transaction. All right, so that's why it says 100, 200. But now if I go back up here and commit, Right? I did my changes, I go to the bottom, I do a select, and now I see the changes, right? Because I added one to b both values. Right? So my sequel is actually doing kind of something smart here, where instead of waiting around, wait, waiting for the deadlock detection thread to figure out there's a deadlock, it saw that there was a deadlock and immediately killed one of them. Killed the one transaction that tried to acquire the lock that was being held by somebody else. Right? 
All right, so let's go back. Let's go to uh, Postgres. Um, so same table, two values, 1, 100, 2, 200. So uh, for now, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the deadlock timeout, again, to be 10 seconds for both of them. Again, like, you know, it, how long should you wait and to see that deadlock's not going to be resolved? So then you've got to kill somebody. All right, so we're going to start the first guy. Oh, sorry. We'll start a transaction here in serializable isolation level. Start a transaction at the bottom. Same thing, the guy at the top is going to uh, update tuple, tuple 1. The guy at the bottom is going to update tuple 2. That's fine. That, that was allowed to happen. Now this guy is going to try to update tuple 2. It pauses because I hold the exclusive lock at the bottom. I try to update tuple 1. Pauses because the, the guy holds the exclusive lock at the top. Right? And then it actually gives you great, get, actually gives you great information. That happened really fast. So deadlock detected. And then it tells you that uh, process 2 or 3 waits for a share lock on transaction and whatever. It's blocked by process at the top, right? And then it recognized that you couldn't do actually what you wanted to do, and then it, it, it go ahead and killed you. And then again, same thing with this guy up here. When this guy got aborted, this thing got was able to get released. Actually, did, did that happen right away, or did it pause for a bit? I did, it paused? Okay, so we can try that again. So let's roll back this guy. Roll back this guy. Right, so same thing, I, if I do... Select star from transaction demo. All right, I see the values I, I would expect. Okay. So let's try this. Let's set the timeout to be something larger. 20 seconds. All right. Start a transaction. Start a transaction. Update tuple 1. Update tuple 2. Update tuple two, pause, because I hold exclusive lock at the bottom. Try to update tuple one, pause. Right? And then 20 seconds from now, within 20 seconds, the deadlock detection will wake up, recognize that there's a deadlock, and kill one of them. And it should kill, actually, maybe the top one? Yeah, nailed it. Right? So what happened there? I started the bottom one first. It had an older timestamp than the top one. Right? Then the top one was the one that got killed because it chose to kill the younger one. And it kept, kept the, the, the bottom one, which is older, alive. All right? This is, why, this is why I love sort of uh, Postgres because it's almost like the exact implementation from a textbook right, to describe these things. Okay? That's a little more complicated example. Um, let's do the same thing. Or actually, you can actually see internally in Postgres that they're waiting for these different locks. So let me roll back my transactions. Actually, let me do this. Let me make a new terminal up here. All right, and this will be the, we'll set the deadlock to 20 seconds up here. So same thing, we'll, we'll begin a transaction in serializable mode here. In serializable mode, there. Uh, first guy will update tuple one. Second guy updates tuple two. This guy tries to update tuple two. This guy tries to update uh, tuple one. Now, in this bottom terminal, before I can get it before it craps out, I can actually run a query against the catalog. Um, and it'll, that's yeah, a little hard to see. But I, this bottom query here, I ran, a query, I, ran, I ran a query into the catalog, and it said, what's the current state of the locks? And you can see here that Postgres is telling you that the process ID of my, of my one of these terminals is being blocked by another terminal. And here's the query that it's being blocked on, right? Set val where ID equals 1, set val where ID equals 2. So again, Postgres is maintaining this internal information in its lock table to know that this query is being blocked by this other other transaction in this other process, and here's the, you know, and here's what it's being blocked on, right? And again, what do we see? We saw that I started the uh, actually I started this one first, 
Um, but then that one, this one got killed, not this one. Right? But that's fine. All right, any questions about this? Yes? All right, so your question is, um, in my example, that uh, it only detected the deadlock when the, the other transaction tried to acquire the lock. All right, so I think he's saying this. All right, so if I go back, uh, again, start a transaction here, start a transaction here, I update tuple one, I update tuple two, now I try to update tuple two, and it pauses, but I don't do anything down here. And your question is, why doesn't it detect a deadlock? At this point here, there's technically not a deadlock. So his question statement is, the, 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 the terminal at the bottom, it may get stalled and never dequeued and never release the lock. Technically, that's not a deadlock. Right, deadlock is when I hold a lock and that I I hold a lock and you I want your lock and you hold that lock and you want to acquire the lock that I hold, right? And this here, like the dependency graph is that this guy holds a lock, but he doesn't depend on anybody else because he already got the lock. The guy above it acquired one lock, but nobody else wants that lock. My bottom guy doesn't want it, but then it wants to acquire the lock that the bottom guy holds. That's not a deadlock. So this. Uh, I think in Postgres we'll stall uh, forever, right? Like our, the cursor here is, is sort of flashing at the bottom because I submitted this and it's just sitting there. There might be a lock timeout command or, or you know setting you can set. I don't know what it is that it'll eventually say this thing's not going anywhere. You you can't proceed. So watch this. So now if I go down here, if I call rollback on this again. Top thread is waiting to acquire an exclusive lock being held by the top, bottom thread. As soon as I roll back, again, I release all my, my locks, top guy completes, because he's not able to acquire it. Okay? Yes? I wonder why it's different, because like, if you don't call rollback or commit, the lock doesn't close. Say again, if you don't call back rollback commit, the lock is what? Sorry? So if you, uh, if you do in this transaction, you don't, and if you don't call commit or rollback, the right. That's not a deadlock, though. That's just a stall. So what I'm saying is there's, there's, and we showed the example when there was a deadlock. Postgres deadlock detector woke up, killed it, killed a transaction, and break the deadlock. Here, it just stalled. Now, there might be another parameter. I, I have to look, to look at the Postgres manual that says, all right, you've waited a minute for this lock. You're not getting it. Let me just kill you. Right? My SQL actually might do that. Right, so then just maybe real quick, roll back this, because we have to make, we want to talk about other things. So same thing, I, I update one, I start transaction, update two, I update two, I can't do that. Um, if I commit, uh, it actually then tells me that I can't let you do that because this guy modified it and committed and therefore this guy would try to update something that this guy overwrote, but it updated something in the past, and that, that's not that's that's not kosher. That's not serializable, so it killed you. Okay. So again, I, I encourage you to just pop in on Postgres and just try things out because it, it almost follows the textbook textbook exactly. Yes. Something is what? Sorry. Something is cold. cold? Oh, killed, yes. Yeah, when, you, when a transaction, again, it's an abort. When I say killed, I mean aborted. All your modifications in that transaction are rolled back, and it's as if the transaction never ran at all. Right? Yes? So can we say that they are actually strict to face locking because the management system only knows that it is safe to release all the locks when a transaction completes? The statement is, since you don't really know what locks you're going to release, because uh, there's no explicit way to do this in SQL, can you say that any system that actually does two-phase locking is really doing strict two-phase locking? As far as I know, yes. 
that, I might be wrong about this, but I, I think yes. I know SQL Server is strict two-phase locking. Uh, I think yes. But the algorithm can be, doesn't have to be that. Okay. The other way to deal with deadlocks is to do, um, I'm sorry. Do deadlock prevention. The idea here is that we're not gonna have a background thread to protect us. We're not gonna have a uh, weights or graph. We're actually gonna, at the moment you try to acquire the lock, do we check to see whether it's, if it's being held by somebody else, what should we actually do, right? And so the way we're gonna do this is that again, transactions are gonna be assigned a priority uh, based on when they arrived in the system, right? It's gonna be given a timestamp. So what we're gonna say is that the older your timestamp is, Right, the farther it is in the past from the current time, then the higher priority you have over other transactions. So say you have transaction T1, T2. Say transaction T1 has timestamp one, transaction T2 has timestamp two. Time, T, time, timestamp one has higher priority over timestamp two. So the two ways to do data prevention are wait die and wound wait. So wait die is, is we're gonna have the Old transactions are allowed to wait for the young transactions, but the young transactions are not allowed to wait for the old transactions. So if I have my requesting transaction is, has a higher priority, meaning it's older, than the transaction that holds the lock that we, the requesting transaction is trying to acquire, then the requesting transaction is allowed to wait for, that, for that, the holding transaction to release it. Otherwise, if it has a lower priority, the requesting transaction has a lower priority, it has to abort. So the old is allowed to wait for the young. Wound wait says that if the requesting transaction has a higher priority than the holding transaction, then you kill the holding transaction, steal their lock, and then start running and keep running, right? Otherwise, the, 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 if the transaction that's requesting the lock has a, has, a, has, a, has a lower priority, meaning they're newer, then you have to wait. So I think a visualization will make this more clear. So the first example, I have T1, T2, T2. T1 starts first, so T1 has a higher priority, but then T2 starts running, gets the exclusive lock on A on first, and then T1 tries to get that same exclusive lock. So under wait, wait die, T1 is, is, has to wait because we allow the old to wait for the young, right? But under wound wait, T1 would be like this old man with a gun, come in and kill the young guy, steal their lock, and then start running, right? Under the other example now, T1 starts first, gets the exclusive lock on A first, and then T2 starts to try to get the exclusive lock, right? So it, has, it can't do that. So under wait and die, T2 would have to abort, right? Because, um, sorry, yeah, wait, wait, die, T2 has to abort because T1 has higher priority, and the younger transaction, T2, is not allowed to wait for T1, so it aborts right away. Uh, under wound wait, though, it's allowed to wait because the, the younger allowed to wait for the old. So what is essentially what essentially this is doing is the same thing we did under latch crabbing. We would have the threads acquire latches always in the same direction, from top to bottom. We're essentially doing the same thing in either of these one or two protocols. So you don't mix these. You're either doing wait and die or you do wound and wait. You don't do both. Right? And this again ensures that transactions are always waiting, always trying to acquire locks in one direction based on these timestamps, and you never have like an old guy hold a lock and a young guy hold a lock. Right, different locks and have a deadlock. They're always going one direction. So that's this is pretty simple, and this is what this solves. Now you don't need a lock, you don't need a lock table. I'm sorry, you don't need a um, a weight or graph. You don't need a background thread. You just you just do this, which I think actually think um, I think uh, my sequel actually might be doing this. I I double check. All right, so we already talked about these issues. Why why are there no deadlocks? Well, there's only one direction of 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 acquisitions. There's only one direction of of one thread or one transaction trying to acquire another lock that's allowed to wait. The otherwise, you, you, you kill yourself or kill them, right? And then when we restart, we always want to make sure we give the transaction the same timestamp. Obviously, what's, what's the obvious reason? Or sorry, when you restart, you use the same timestamp. And the, you know, the reason why you want to do this is because otherwise, if you just keep getting restarted and get a new timestamp, you can get starved out. So at some point, you're going to be the oldest guy around, right? And you'll be killing things or waiting for things, right? You can do whatever you want. Right, so that's why you always reuse the same timestamp every time you restart a transaction. So is this clear? Okay. So, so far, uh, we've been assuming that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between any lock that we're acquiring in our database 
and the and 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 the objects that we want to acquire locks on, right? One table, one lock. One table, one lock. But going to the lock manager actually is not cheap, right? Because we have to protect that with latches because we want to have multi-threaded concurrent access into our internal data structures. So now if I want to update a billion tuples, it's going to suck if I have to acquire a billion locks or you know, on, on those, the, all those tuples. So a way we can solve this is through lock granularities or hierarch hierarchical locking. And so now what's going to happen is when a transaction wants to acquire a lock, we can make a decision about what that lock should be on. Right? Should it be on the database? Should it be on, on the table? Should it be on the a tuple? Right? And then the goal of this is now to require us to acquire the few amount of locks that we have to need to actually do what we want to do. And again, there's going to be this trade-off between, you know, you can acquire an exclusive lock on the entire database and do whatever you want, right? And that's the easiest thing to do, and you don't, you don't have to acquire one lock, but that, minimizes, or that reduces the amount of parallelism you have because now nobody else can do anything at the same time, right? It's actually what a lot of systems used to do in the, you know, I'm saying old days, but like this is the most simplest thing to do. Acquire a single lock on, on the entire database. SQLite does this because they're running in embedded environments, right? It's not the same, that's not actually true because they have one writer thread but multiple reader threads. But MongoDB essentially used to do this. They would have an exclusive lock on, I think, the entire database, right? And then they maybe got it down to a single table, a single collections, and now they actually do the smart thing because they bought this other, they bought this company called Wire Tiger. So, the way to think about it, we have this hierarchy, and our transaction comes to come along. And so if it acquires a lock on the table, and again, a table has tuples, the tuples have attributes, it implicitly requires locks on everything below it. So now we only need to go to our lock manager and say, hey, give me a share lock on the table, and then all everything below it becomes, you know, is put in a share lock mode. All right? We still have to do two-phase locking here. Right? We've got to make sure that nobody is, you know, we have threads trying to acquire these locks of these different objects at the same time. Right? And we want to make sure we always go in the same direction. Like we can acquire locks as we go down. We don't want to go, go in the other direction. Right? But this is sort of another dimension we can have to, make, make, to improve the amount of parallelism we can have in our system. So let's look at an example. So again, we want to get my, I have an offshore shady bank account, and I want to get how much money I got in there right, because I'm trying to dodge taxes or whatever, and then we have the TA, Lynn, and he's going to go increase the balance of his, his, his account by 1%. So the question is, what kind of locks do we want to acquire? Well, the answer is multiple ones. So we can have exclusive and shared locks for the, le the leaf nodes in our lock tree, right, say, say we just do tuples at the very bottom, um, but then we can have what are these called, the in in what are called intention locks, what are like hints to the upper parts of the tree to tell other transactions what's going on down below it so that you can then make the scheduling decisions about whether uh, you're going to be able to acquire the locks that you want uh, down below before you get there. Right? So again, an intention lock, essentially allow, you take an intention lock on a, on a higher level node in the tree. Right? You don't take an intention lock on the leaf nodes. And it's a hint to other transactions to say, hey, I have a lock down here in, or I have a node down here in exclusive mode or shared mode. Uh, you may not know actually which one, but just, just so you know, if you want to do something like that one lock the entire thing, you could do that without have, having to check every single tuple or every, every, every single node below it. So if a node in the upper part of the tree is in intention mode, then you're going to have explicit locking going down below either shared lock or exclusive lock. So there's three types of intention locks. The first is shared, uh, intention shared. That just says that below me in the tree, there's a lock, there's a, a node being in, locked in shared mode. Intention exclusive says that at a lower node, there's a lock in exclusive mode. The one that always sort of fouls up students is shared intention exclusive. It just says that I'm taking a, the node in, in the upper part of the tree in shared mode, and, and implicitly that means I have everything below it in shared mode. But I also have an intention exclusive mode lock at the, at the inner part to say that somewhere down below I have an exclusive lock on one node. Right? So you, you get a shared lock on everything, but then it's a hint to say, oh, by the way, I'm also doing a, uh, an exclusive lock somewhere else. So you can put these all in a giant compatibility matrix, and now we're expanding what we had before. So the way you think, look at this, is like, say T1 holds a node in one of these five locks, and then T2 wants to acquire a node, the same node in, 
and other these five locks. So intention shared basically can be compatible with everybody except for exclusive. Exclusive is never compatible with anybody. But here you can see that, again, as, as you sort of go up, things are less, less compatible with other ones. So if you have shared lock and you want to get intention exclusive, you can't do that. Same with the shared intention exclusive, but shared lock is okay. Right? This probably doesn't make sense, so let's, let's, let's go through an example. So what's going to happen is we're going to start at the top part of the tree. And at each level as we go down, for example, we'll just have two levels. We make a decision about, based on what operations we want to do on the database, what lock modes do we need to acquire? All right, so we can get a, uh, in order to acquire a, a shared mode lock or intention shared below me, I have to make sure I have the right locks above me. So to get a shared lock or intention shared lock on a, on a node, then I have to hold at least an intention shared above me or something greater than that. Right? If I want an exclusive lock or intention exclusive or shared intention exclusive, then I must at least hold an intention exclusive above me. So again, let's do a really simple example here. Right? So again, we want to use, we want to get all the money I have in my bank account. So I want to read a, a single record in the table. So we only have two hierarchy, two levels. We have the table locks and then we have the tuple locks. So our transaction shows up, wants to read a record in, in table R, and this is my record here. So in order to read this, I have to have a shared lock on the tuple itself, but I can take a higher level intention lock above, above me so that I'm not locking all the tuples in shared mode. Right? So in this, I can do shared, shared, in, shared in, sorry, intention shared for table R, and then I just do my shared lock on, the tuple, on my particular tuple. So now if anybody comes along and, and wants to do like an exclusive lock on the entire table, that's going to be incompatible with the intention shared. So then Lynn wants to do a read, or sorry, wants to update his record, and he wants to update uh, his, his tuple over here. He can get a shared intent, or sorry, he can get an intention exclusive lock here. That's compatible with intention shared, right? It's just hints, above, hints for other people. And then he can go and get the exclusive lock for this one tuple that it wants to modify, and then we're done. Again, these are just hints for other transactions to say, if you go proceed down to the tree, you may or may not be able to get the lock that you want. Because what we don't want to happen is we don't want to maybe acquire, you know, uh, we want to acquire locks for a billion tuples. We don't want to acquire for 999 million and 999, all of them. And the last one we can't get because somebody else holds an exclusive lock and we just wasted all that work trying to go into the lock manager. So we, we sort of push up into the tree as much information as possible, what's going below it, so that we do, end up don't, we end up not wasting work. So this is a more complicated example. We have three transactions, T1, T2, T3. T1 wants to scan R and update a few tuples. T2 is going to read a single tuple in R, and then T3 is going to scan two tuples in R, and then, uh, sorry, T1 scans, all, scans them all, updates one. T2 is going to read a single tuple, and then T3 is going to scan all of them. All right, so we first start off with T, T1, wants to scan R and, read, and update a few of them. So it just wants to read these two here and then update this last one. So it can go ahead and get at the table node and get a shared intention exclusive. Again, now that implicitly locks all the tuples in shared mode, right? But then it only needs to get the exclusive lock on its one tuple. So tuple one and tuple two are implicitly in shared mode, right? Because it wants to read them. But then in the last one, we get an exclusive mode. So for this transaction, say, you know, say this is a billion tuples along the bottom, I only had to acquire two locks. Right? That's a pretty good trade-off. T2 wants to read a single tuple in R, so it's going to read this tuple here that's not being modified, so it can get the intention shared on the table R. That's compatible with, with shared intention exclusive. And then it can go and get the explicit shared lock on this tuple, and we're good to go. Right? T Transaction 3 wants to scan all the tuples in R, Right? And again, we could just go down and get a shared lock on every single tuple, but instead we'll try to get a shared lock on the table itself. Right? But this is not compatible with shared intention exclusive because one guy is, is, is modifying this, this tuple and it has an exclusive lock, so therefore this transaction has to stall until this thing is released. And I found that out as soon as I tried to lock the, the table in, in shared mode. 
right? Had I gone down to the leaf nodes and acquired explicit shared locks on every single tuple, I would have only found out that I couldn't do my query until I got to the last one. Because right? you have to acquire all the locks you want on all the objects you want to access before you're allowed to do whatever it is what you want to do. So it's not like there's an iterator where I'm going to read a tuple, can acquire the next lock, read the next tuple, acquire the next lock. Right? So it has to happen all at once. Yes? I should just, yes. So his, his statement is the intention shared lock has the same, you said priority? Yeah, it's, uh, it's okay here, it's the same, right? It says the same priority as what? Shared? Uh, as what, sorry? Wait, say it again. Sorry, say it again. Sorry. IS has the same behavior as IX. IS has the same behavior as IS? IS has the same behavior as IX. As IX? Yeah. Um, no, right? So, so if you hold IX, you're not, if you want to get, if you hold, this guy holds IX, you want to get a shared lock, that's not compatible, right? If I hold IS and I want to get a shared lock, that is compatible, right? So it's not, they're not compatible. Not, they're not exactly the same. Okay. So again, the main idea with these hardcore locks is that it, it minimizes the number of locks that a transaction has acquired in order to do the work that it wants to do. And this minimizes our traffic or contention of how we go into the lock manager, right? And these are just sort of the rules you have to apply about how to, uh, if, you want to if you want to get a share lock or exclusive lock down below, what kind of locks you, you need to hold above it, right? And we talked a little bit about that before about uh, lock escalation, but like the, the, I, you can upgrade your locks. If I hold a share lock and go to an exclusive lock, but also you can, you can say, if I have to acquire a bunch of share locks down below, Maybe I could restart my traversal into the, the, the tree and just maybe acquire the share lock up that, that I should have gotten above me. Right? Yes? It seems like the intention lock is kind of an indication that what kind of lock is going to get held at a lower level. Correct. That, that's what I was trying to say. It's a hint to other transactions of what's going on. So why don't we just use the same approach as we did in the plus tree? That's like you're locking from the root and we're going to go down and you're going to like you're, you're going to use So his question is, why don't we just do the same thing? Why don't we do lock coupling or, or sorry, latch coupling or latch crabbing in the B plus tree? Is as you're traversing the tree, you start releasing the locks uh, that you don't think you need anymore. Yeah. Why is that a bad idea? Yes. Exact. Yes, that violates two phase locking. And under two phase locking, as soon as I acquire a lock. So when I release a lock, I can't go acquire more. So two-phase locking falls on this, under this tree, right? So what about you just like descend down to the leaf and then you release all the other? So statement is, all right, you just descend down to the leaf and then you delete, you release all your ancestors. Okay, so what we're talking about here is really sort of like for one query, right? You have to do sort of the same thing for the next query. And now you're, you can't acquire locks because you already released them. So like if you're accessing another table, this actually, there's still a violation. His question is, or statement is, if you're accessing another table and I release locks on another table, if I try to acquire new locks on, on, that, on the second table, that violates two-phase locking? Yes. It's for the entire database. Yeah, it's sort of confusing about, the, I'm showing you a tree, and it looks like the, like you know the B plus tree, but it's not the same. This is like an internal lock hierarchy. All right, um, I have I have like two minutes. Let me just go through real quick locking in practice, and then we'll cover isolation levels next class. All right. So as I said before, you don't actually acquire locks manually in in your queries, right? There's, you can provide hints though to the database system about what your what your transaction is actually going to do, right? 
And you, there are ways to lock the entire table, uh, which is the next slide, and, but you actually don't want to really write programs using this. Right? So this is actually not part of the SQL standard, but most database systems allow you to do something like this. And it's usually like lock table and the table name and then whatever mode that you want. Right? And the great thing about Postgres and the other major commercial database systems, they follow the textbook. So they have shared locks and exclusive locks. My SQL always wants to be different. So instead of a shared lock, they call it a read lock. Instead of an exclusive lock, they call it a write lock. But the idea is basically the same. So here's how to lock the entire table in the different modes. Right? Postgres has, is, is more, more terse. Um, and then SQL Server has this select one thing, which I, I, you know, I don't fully understand. So you can lock the entire table. You do, usually don't want to do this. Um, and then there's an unlock command to un unlock it later on. The, there are, again, there's also a way to provide hints to the data system about what your transaction is going to do or query is going to do. And so, as I said, anytime you run a, run a select query, the data system is going to acquire the shared lock for the objects that you're accessing in that query. But maybe you're going to read it first and then modify it later on in the same transaction. So instead of acquiring the shared lock the first time and then the exclusive lock later on, because we can upgrade our locks, you can say a hint in your select statement to say, I'm going to read this tuple, but I'm going to update it later. So don't acquire the shared lock, actually acquire the exclusive lock. Right? This is called select for update. So you just have your select statement and then you just tack on this for update at the end. Right? You can also do this. Uh, you know, for in shared mode, doesn't actually do anything, right? It's just sort of there, right? Because when you read it, it can be shared mode anyway. All right. All right. So, any questions about this? So I want to stop here, and then we'll pick up on isolation levels and phantoms uh, next class. Is there any questions? All right, guys. Uh, see you. Have a good weekend. See you on Monday. Uh, the bright light talk will be tomorrow, and then project three is posted on the internet. Homework 4 is also available on the internet. And then I'll send out more information on how to get started on the extra credit this weekend. OK? All right, guys. Take care. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes. It's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cuff, so y'all yeah, cause I drink brew. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Show. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watch, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the four. Six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>